<laughs> On the pavement, people scurry, both to and fro. A clap of thunder, bam! Or some really gusty wind. Everyone agrees it's a pretty dramatic evening all round. Pan right. It's a hospital room. A clammy pregnant woman lies spread eagled on the bed. <laughs> and is about to produce a pit of patter of her own. <laughs> She's not going to wet herself. <laughs> well, that's often a distressing side effect of childbirth. <laughs> I'm referring to the pit of patter of children's feet. Stand back, says the midwife. Her contraptions are massive. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Anthony Eden's about to be named Prime Minister, mutters a nurse as he strolls past the door. <laughs> and Chelsea are about to win the first division title, replies an orderly, almost certainly not educated enough to follow politics. <laughs> In the corner of the room, walk around the clock like Bill Haley blasts from the radio. <laughs> you see, this wasn't now, it's then. The present tense used in this passage is just a literary device, as I mentioned earlier. So this next bit comes to surprise. The scene is actually unfolding in 1955. The hospital, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in King's Lynn. The sweaty woman, Mrs. Dorothy Partridge, my mother. And the child's head slithering from her legs. <laughs> to me. The child was I, Partridge. <laughs> You've done it! Brilliant pushing, says the midwife. She holds aloft the newborn child like a captain lifting a fleshy world cup. <laughs> and the child throws back his head and roars the roar of freedom. The noise is relatively nonsensical, but no less intelligent than most babies will produce. In fact, it's probably a bit more switched on than average. In many ways, the proud wail that burst from my lungs was my first broadcast. The literal audience of no more than eight, that still equated to an audience share in the delivery room at least, of the cool 100%. <laughs> Not bad, I probably thought. Not bad at all. Um, the next passage I'd like to read out is from a rather traumatic period in my life when I split from my uh, wife Carol uh, in the mid-90s. Um, I kept a diary at the time, and it was very traumatic, um, but uh, I'll just read you one of the ent entrances from the diary, then I'll uh, relate to the conversation I had the night I learned that my wife was uh, well, they're betraying. <laughs> December 1st, 1995. Had a long chat with Bill Oddie. Next thing. <laughs> he lent me his binoculars and has given me some advice on how to remain still for long periods of time and go completely undetected in undergrowth and shrubbery. <laughs> it's surprising how many of these techniques can be used to track an enemy or an spouse. <laughs> and I'm sleep forward slightly here. Yes, it seems the French smelling sex provider was Carol's fitness instructor. <laughs> Far from being French, he was actually from Luton. His only Frenchness was his cowardly duplicitousness and the kissing he did with my wife. <laughs> I was waiting for Carol just for when she got back from the gym that evening. She breezed into the kitchen as I sat at the kitchen table with a bottle of wine. I hadn't dropped it or opened it. Drinking during the day makes me nauseous. I think the effect worked. Been enjoying yourself, I said, but with loads of emphasis, so that it was clear that enjoying might have a double meaning. <laughs> mm -hmm, she said, like she didn't have a bloody clue. <laughs> have a nice time at the gym, I said, making inverted commas around the word gym in my fingers. <laughs> yes, she said, her knowledge of mind punctuation was pitiful. <laughs> have a good workout, I said, spotting my right forefinger in and out of a hole. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she said, not a flip. <laughs> Who doesn't understand the finger sex mind? <laughs> I lost it, throwing my empty wine glass crashing to the floor. It landed on the carpet of the hall in one piece. <laughs> Careful, she said, suddenly irritated. You nearly broke that. What? Like you broke my heart. <laughs> Silence. I was particularly pleased with this line because it's the sort of thing I'd usually think of long afterwards and then admonish myself not to be comfortable. <laughs> I know, Carol, I know. But then she turned to face me and looked so sad that I started to cry on her behalf. And then on my behalf, and then I didn't know on whose behalf I was crying because I was making a right mess. I had a cold at the same time, so it was like a, like a nuchal tsunami. 
She picked up the wine glass and handed it to me so I could have another go, and this time it catted onto the lino where the stem snapped. Still not the smithereen effect I'd been wanting, but then a bit better than before. Thanks, she said. Then she led me out into the garden and explained she'd been having an affair with her fitness instructor. I asked all the obvious questions. Since when? Why him? How can you be attracted to a man who basically wears leotards? <laughs> she told me all about him, including his name. Eventually, after lots of crying, me, shouting, me, and sighing, both. <laughs> we went back inside. We realised that the next door neighbours were having a pre-Christmas drink so could hear everything. <coughs> Enjoying this? I shouted through the hedge. You like a bit of grief with your mulled wine? I thought afterwards. <laughs> I explained to Cal that I'd forgive her. We'd try again in the morning. Perhaps go and talk to Sue Cook about it. <laughs> she was shaking her head. I began frantically pitching shows of her, desperately outlining my portfolio of programme ideas in the hope of convincing her that we could be happy and rich. But she just kept shaking her head. The doorbell went. Bill Oddy was standing there. <laughs> I opened the door to him and was just saying, this isn't a good time, Bill. And he saw Carol. He could see I'd been crying and was clearly doing the mental maths. No one spoke for a while, then Carol gathered up the things, rushed past and headed back to the micro. She turned the ignition and the blast of the winner takes it all came from the speaker. <laughs> I began to cry. She looked at me through the windscreen and reversed very proficiently onto the road. <laughs> We watched her go until she disappeared around the corner, at which point we stopped watching. I noticed Oddie was just standing there. Not a good time, though. Yeah, I know, he said. I just want to find him. <laughs> and finally, um, I'd like to have an upbeat note. I'd like to read an extract of my uh, life with uh, Sonia, um, the Eastern European girlfriend I had for a period, um, who I had a very full and uh, an enjoyable sex life. <laughs> and I'd just like to sort of uh, 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 refer and, and um, relate to you uh, one of our sexual experiences. <laughs> but at the time I was living in a caravan, so, um, that, which explains the location. <clears throat> Using the full area of the caravan, I like to pretend to be a KGB agent. <laughs> but as a Ukrainian who'd spent half her life as part of the Eastern Bloc, She'd rather pretend to be an East German gypsy. So I did the stars. I asked to see her papers before rousing her from behind over the twin halves that were for sale for me a work She pretends to be confused and, uh, well, I think you get the idea, gents. <laughs> and that one was drawn down the way. But it was more than sexual, apart from the lots of sex we were having. Sonia had plenty more to offer. She had a wonderful anti-aging effect on me, like oil of ole has on middle-aged women's cracked, happy skin. <laughs> Energetic, boisterous, and really, really zesty. She loved to laugh. Boy, how she loved to laugh. And she had a relatively infectious skin. I'm glad to say that that, the, that was the only thing that was infectious about her. I had fully checked out before anything else. A lot of nonsense is spoken about germs being passed from one to another. Uh, there's nothing more unsexy than talking about venereal disease. Um, so what I merely do is suggest, or insist, that we both take a hot bath together with three capitals of Detta. <laughs> sexy and hygiene. <laughs> all in all, Sonia had that indiscriminate fun-loving policy that you often find from people from post-Soviet regime. <laughs> it's as if the people have cast off the state-imposed grumpiness of communism and are grabbing life with both hands. And while, of course, it becomes incredibly tiresome, it does, after a while, start to grate. But Sonia's love of practical jokes, sex, laughter, chintzy homeware, and relentless intercourse was a sometimes source of periodic happiness. We broke up just hours after the house was completed. She was understandably miffed by this, but I explained patently, I explained patiently in rudimentary English, it was a new build, so I wanted shoes on at the door. And she was hopeless at the moment to do this. Breaking the news to her wasn't easy. We'd been together for a year and a half, for goodness sakes, and she often talked about marriage. Uh, ideally to me, but at a push to anyone with UK citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> this was a big deal for her, so I locked myself in the bathroom mat and got my assistant to do it. She broke the news with some relish. A bit too much, if you ask me. Of course, Sonia was devastated. She kept banging on the door and telling me to come out and face her. 
Knowing that she, knowing she was from a former Soviet country where human rights atrocities are commonplace, I had no idea what she was capable of. So I made a choice to stay inside. Come out, Alan, she was shouting. Through the door I could hear my assistant trying to placate slash fib to her. He's not in there anymore, she attempted. He climbed out of the window and ran off. I winced at her utter inability to lie and pledged to find her ten pounds. Alan, I love you, she kept shouting. Sonia, not my assistant. <laughs> Poor kid, I thought, as I did my belt up. I was in the top of the I became less sympathetic with each shout because it was repetitive, and the only thing and the only thing I, I can enjoy which is repetitive is the theme of Steve Sunday. <laughs> she stayed for absolutely ages. I found this irritating because I promised to send a showreel to bid up TV. And the post office was going to shut. After a few hours she calmed down and sloped off, but I missed the last post. I never got the BUTV job. Shame, because it was one of my favourite channels, and I used to practice the pattern in the shower, imagining I was saying Raybox or a bar. <laughs> well, uh, that's all from the book. If you want to uh, read it, you have to do that yourself. Um, there is a, a talking book, um, there's an audio book, in which, I, which is eight hours long, in which I, I read the book um, out loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if someone would like to remove the lectern and um, I will sit behind the desk and sign, picture, sign, sign the book for you. Um, uh, if you don't mind, can just have a, uh, it's nothing personal, but um, I'm just going to, in case you want to shake hands. <laughs> uh, so, uh, just because uh, if I did capture anything, it would be a nightmare trying to track down who was the uh, person who was also. So I'll be, I'll be very <laughs> Okay, if you'd like to play down my microphone, I'm about to have some private conversations. Mm -hmm. Did you send it to us? Well, yeah. <laughs>